Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Papa, for inviting me. And uh, can you hear me? Okay, so this is a joint work with Evan Shahba there. Um, this is part of a big project on neuro mathematics supported by Papest. And this paper, the original paper, appeared in GSP last year. And uh, this article is dedicated to a legal procedure. Okay, so let, let's start. So I, I'm really interested in modeling systems of neurons. So it's not a pretext, I, I really want to do it. Of course, uh, as Anton knows quite well, we must do something very easy in order to be able to do to have some results. So I'm looking for some type, something like the easy model for neural systems. So something which is very simplified, but yet has some of the qualitative features we find in the neural systems. So uh, neurons talk to each other. They find sequences of action potentials. We call the action potential a spike. And uh, each spike uh, uh, has something like uh, one millisecond. I'm going to make a, a discrete time model uh, in which I tell, in, I have a window, time window. I now tell for each, spike, for each neuron if it has a spike or not in this small time window. Um, well, uh, uh, people call this a spike train. Probably I use the spike train during the, the talk. Let me show you. This is a Haster, Haster plot. You have uh, several, several neurons, and you have uh, uh, horizontal axis time. <coughs> you have neurons here. And uh, I'm, I'm indicating the times which uh, every neuron is, uh, has a spike. Now, the basic questions are how is information, external stimuli, encoded in, in, in this way? So, we believe that the spike trains encode all our perceptions, external world, or feelings, thought. How is this done? I guess people call this neuronal coding, and as a matter of fact, uh, people do not know, do not know what is a neuronal code. Um, what Evan, I believe uh, is that the neuronal code is a product measure. So I'm going to talk to you about a product measure in a space of configurations, time space configurations. So uh, the second base question is how to model brain plasticity. So you know the brain is able to create new connections <coughs> and it do it all the time. That's how we learn. And that's how we recover from a brain stroke, for instance. And uh, uh, we don't know how to model brain plasticity really. And, uh, and then you have uh, effects that are well known, like evoke the potential. You show people uh, pictures of a known person. Well, I, when I'm in Brazil, my joke uh, is uh, say, you show Maradona, the body recognized. So, clearly, <laughs> you show Maradona, everybody recognizes. <laughs> You show my picture, nobody recognizes. You show Pablo's picture, nobody recognizes. Then you show Maradona, and if you have an EEG recording in the person, you will see that there is synchronization. Um, uh, there is a, a microscopic activity obtained by synchronizing several, uh, several thousands, thousands of neurons together. And our goal is to find a model in which this kind of phenomena can be um, obtained in a rigorous way, somehow. So this is really what we want to do. Now, uh, we, you, we have around 10 to the power 11 neurons. So it's a, you could say it's an infinite set of neurons, because 10 to the power 11 is infinite. Uh, in practical terms, finite is 10, 20, 30, after 
1,000 is no longer finite. And this is 10 to the power of 11. <laughs> Um, so, a spike train for each neuron i, uh, we indicate if there is a spike in this neuron at a certain time. Time actually is a, is a time window. So, I put here time. Can you read the time here? And then you have a spike, you have windows which uh, say, three milliseconds, and uh, you say if the neon eye has a spike, yes <coughs> or not. Yeah. So, um, you have uh, a process which takes value in the set Z1 to the power i. Um, for experimental data, usually I take a window of less three milliseconds. Now, uh, there is a background, uh, models for systems of um, integrated of, of neurons exist. Yesterday, Marcelo Magnasco and um, uh, Neil spoke about the concrete models. So you have a Nobel Prize in the 50s to describe how one neuron evolves. But also you have systems of neurons described by people, several people, including uh, Windows Sark, uh, Bags and Plan, and so on. And the more familiar model is what they call, they call integrated and fire models. So, let me describe it. Um, the membrane potential process of one neuron accumulates stimuli. I'm using stimulus in a very loose way. I, I, want to, I want to say difference of potential. It, it's a more complicated uh, model. And uh, in a few seconds, Pablo will ask me, will ask me a question. So pay attention, Pablo. <laughs> each neuron is part of a probability which is an increasing function of its accumulated potential. And uh, after spiking, it resets its membrane potential to zero, to minus. So, so let's put zero. It's not zero, it's something negative, but let's put zero and he started receiving stimuli. Okay, before uh, that point, Pablo asks me, but this is just a sun pile model. It's just spare parts. And, well, it's not, because you don't have mass conservation here. You don't, the, 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 the spike in neuron does not give to the other neurons something which is proportional to the accumulated membrane potential. Uh, it gives some fixed amount, which has to do with the synaptic interaction. So it's not a mass uh, conservative model. <laughs> now, if you look at this, uh, the, the, the picture is, this is a chain. If you look at a single neuron, this is a chain which, which has a memory of variable lengths. The member of each neuron goes back to the last spiking time of this neuron. Um, <coughs> this is in particular the framework considered by Bruno Cessac a few years ago. And I, Evan and I were very much influenced by this paper. Um, but Bruno, for some reasons, only considered a finite number of neurons. And this is a serious problem because we want to speak about the countable set of neurons, countable infinite set of neurons. So our model is the following. So if you only remember one thing of the talk, this should be the thing you should remember. So I have xt, which is a configuration which tells a time t, a time window t, which are the neurons who had a uh, natural potential spike. I is countable, in our case, is countable infinite. Uh, and the time evolution is the following. Uh, given the past, every neuron decides what to do in the next step independently of the others. And then maybe Marcel could make an uh, object and say, well, what, what do you do with uh, uh, electric synapse? I not consider electric synapse in which you have some kind of potlatch effect. <coughs> but this does not 
seems to change now the qualitative features of the model. <coughs> so formally, I have uh, uh, the probability of time t of neuron i to have uh, activity a of i 1 or 0. I'm considering a finite set of neurons in this infinite set given the past. So this is the product. Um, and now I must tell you what is the value of the probability for every neuron. So and this is made the most uh, nasty picture. So uh, here you have a, a function t of i. And then inside you have several objects. I'll try to explain them to you. So, uh, Wj of i, Wj taken to i, is the uh, intensity, the snap weight of the interaction to, of j to i. It's a real number. It's a new real number. L i of t, so you see in the sum here, you count how many spikes you had, you had after the last spike. L a of i of t is the last, last spiking activity. J, j multiplies x s. So if you want to have j, if you only have the w j, let me write it here. <coughs> So you have a sum and here you have W J goes to I and here you have T uh, S from I L of T time minus one X S J. So if you all have this this counts how many spikes J sent to I? So you have here J, that is the last spike in time of I before T. So you count how many spikes J has sent to I in this time interval. Now you have another effect. Is that maybe there is some kind of leak effect? You lose some of the potential. And this is given by J, J of the time difference between T minus S. Say for instance, J only uh, only take into account um, spikes which took place in the last uh, not know how many steps. Or maybe J decreases this way, okay? Uh, actually, it's more simple with a J which decreases from the mathematical point of view. J simplifies because it gives you a short memory. In reality, J, J, uh, J occurs. And then you have this last T minus LA of T, which is kind of an aging effect, okay? The, the WJI? It's a real number. And fixed. It's fixed. Unfortunately, but uh, we will be obliged uh, in the future <coughs> to change it. Yes, it's fixed. At the time scale of uh, what we're looking at, it's fixed. So, so if S is uh, bigger than L prime T and uh, smaller than T minus 1, I understand that excess of J is 0. Or, yeah, but for summing. You count how many spikes you received from J. So if uh, if, uh, if if there is no leak effect, if this was one, for instance, so you just count how many how many uh, inputs you received from J. Okay, this is the total number of inputs you received from J. But T is always bigger than T, of course. By definition. Uh, T is, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you see, L i of T is the supreme of S, is smaller than T, uh, such that the uh, neuron I had a spike. It's the last spike in time of, uh, of I. 
So that was your question, I'm sorry. I was thinking of something else. Thank you, Paul. So now, uh, uh, the neurons who had uh, an influence on I are those for which the synapse rate is no zero, not zero. And uh, you have two possibilities. This synaptic rate uh, is positive. This means that the, the activity of J is excitatory on I. Negative uh, is inhibitory. And in a few seconds, I will tell you some weakness of the paper, which is associated to this. OK, now let me make some advertising. So this is a new class of models. This is not my problem. And uh, they have a countable number of interacting components. So it extends in a non-trivial way the class of uh, wonderful models that Spitzer introduced uh, 40 years ago, more or less. 41 years ago, I guess. Because uh, they are not models, because the Spitzer's model all my problem. This is not my problem. And it also extends the class of uh, stochastic chains with memory of variable mass introduced by Jean Marissani. I introduced it generally uh, when I list because these models are only locally of variable length. So you have all the interactions, which means that you can go, you must be obliged to go back to minus infinity to decide about next step. So this is a chain of infinite order with a non countable state space. And this is an interesting object from. Uh, purely mathematical point of view. But now, Marcelo, I hope that this is also interesting from a biological point of view. And this is a real um, question. <coughs> well, discrete time is not important. Evan and I decided to write it in discrete time because we believe it was more easy for neurobiologists to read in discrete time. Well, that was wrong. It's so difficult for them to read in discrete or in continuous time. So we made a statistic choice Our model is reminiscent of the Hawke's process. It's reminiscent. Uh, in discrete time, it could be continuous time. It's reminiscent. So, for instance, I want to pay by Bremo and Massoulier, but uh, we have a limited number of components, and Hawke's process are usually considered as a finite framework. And uh, you have the, we have this particularly interesting structure of having locally uh, this variable length memory. So Hopf's process would be something that in which the sum goes back to minus infinity, and here you have a decreasing function to make the sum uh, summable. But this is less interesting from, I guess, in a statistical and applied point of view. OK, mathematical questions. Given the set of uh, interactions, the function c is an is a, is a increasing function, something like this. <coughs> so really, given t, t of i, given the synaptic waves, given the leak effect, does a chain with the Bob dynamics exist? Is it unique? And uh, the answer, that's the content of our paper, <coughs> yes, you have one, uh, I will explain it to you. And then, when we brought the paper, we said, well, it, it, we could invent several models. Now the question is, are, is this model able to reproduce qualitative features you find in the literature? So, there are a lot of uh, interesting descriptions. So we, we, we decided to, to, to attack one of the descriptions. The description uh, has to do with the inter-spike intervals, as they correlated. And then you have a very precise uh, description of data and in which consideration about this. And this is both a mathematical and a biological question. 
And then at the end of the talk, I will show you what you can do about this question. And of course, we have lots of experimental facts to explain. So now I start speaking about the existence and uniqueness. If you have questions, it's time to ask me. So the, uh, the, the support of the function g that you're using, g t minus s, mm -hmm. I, I would say you would get very different qualitative behavior if the support yes. is finite or yes. is infinite, yes. also the speed of decrease. Yes. And does this have anything to do with existence and uniqueness, or none at all? Well, uh, you, you, you have two possible uh, kind uh, types of conditions. I, I show one of them to you. Actually, in this case, we consider j equal to one constant, which is a more, maybe say, difficult per case. Because if you take j decreasing to it, so you can use the continuity results. Yeah. So uh, I guess j is important because if you want to. to to say things about uh, the way uh, inhibition and the excitation place together, you ma must consider J. But, uh, well, just in the beginning. So but in this case, one of the theoretics is for J equal 1, constant. But theta to the T minus S is the most common use, exponential. Yes, yes. And then you can use uh, the continuity results. But the important uh, mathematical aspect is that we don't need the continuity. And this where is Roberto Fernandez? This is Roberto Fernandez here. So Roberto uses all this continuity. We don't need it. G is dependent on J or is equal for all the numbers? Well, it could be dependent on J. Uh, but in our case, uh, I think J is in, in the example, we go to one, yes. But it could one be. Everywhere. Yes, yes. Actually, the model is not homogeneous, but to we. Really, you do not have uh, a good uh, anatomic description of the system. I guess this is one of the main questions. How to put extra information <laughs> in the graph? So let me use some notation. So I, I, I call P1 given X. So X is uh, the history back to the past. I am obliged to put T since there is a T there appearing. So, uh, so that's just notation. Uh, well, it depends, you see, it depends on this. Every, every, every neuron I only consider the situation after it lasts the spike time. But maybe J has a lasting spike time here. And maybe J is influenced by a K, which has a lasting spike time here. So, after this is an infinite order system, it's not a finite order system. Uh, in general, the function the deliver is not continuous. It's very easy to produce <coughs> examples, and Roberto is aware. Of it. I guess we, we talk about it in this, this section. So, um, so most of the papers on infinite order, order chains, as Pablo and Robert and Servette, use uh, this continuity. Okay, so uh, what kind of hypothesis do we use for our theorem? So here we are taking phi constant, and uh, you are supposing that it's kind of Lipschitz condition, and here two is a very is a is a clear weakness of the paper. Now I ask you why is this a weak point of the paper? And uh and you don't want the absolute value. Exactly. But you know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Because you see uh, we are considering all the absolute values and this is kind of a dilution condition. But the good condition would be a balance between excitation and inhibition. But with uh, our approach, we cannot do it. So that's a weak point, and I hope uh, one of the young, bright uh, probabilists here uh, will be able to get, back, get a better result, uh, take into account uh, the fact that the inhibition and excitation should balance each other. So this is a condition which works, but it's not a good condition. Uh, so now, we are, we are assuming a spontaneous spike in activity. Uh, we don't need to. 
uh, formulates a theorem with no spontaneous spiking activity, but uh, with a decrease in chain. Uh, spontaneous spiking activity, Marcelo, I guess, <coughs> plays the role of external stimulus. And so I think it would be interesting if we refer, uh, rewrite the model considering external stimulus. I will come back to this uh, at the end of the talk. So the theorem. Under the conditions with delta big enough, you have a unique chain, you have the speed of convergence, and um, if uh, you have something about j, so the first one is for j equal 1, maybe. You can get ahead it. So these are uh, uniqueness conditions. It is a uniqueness condition. And uh, the proof is based in a perfect simulation construct. So we construct it. Uh, and as in many proofs of a perfect simulation, what you do is to, to make a, a Kalikov decomposition. So what is Kalikov decomposition? So that's the idea Steve Kalikov had uh, 20 years ago, I guess. It's a way to represent, uh, to represent the probability transitions of chains of infinite order as a finite combination, as a finite combination of uh, transition probabilities of chains of order 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I learned this in a paper Pablo, Roberto, and Servette wrote uh, a few years ago. And then uh, we used this idea in a more general framework. You remember this paper? Comets. With comets. Ah, not Servette, comets, yes. Francis Comets. Uh, Ferrari and Fernandez. Uh, so what what is new here, technically, is to condition on the set of the spontaneous spike in activity given by the delta. Remember, you have a delta, which is a probability of having a spike, whatever is your potential. So we, we use this to make a new decomposition. And uh, so if you use this finite horizontal, which is the last time you have a spike, a spontaneous spike in activity, uh, you can do the job, uh, the proposition that you can decompose your transition probability uh, in such a way that uh, for each k, you only depend on a finite set of points and on the past until your last spontaneous spike in activity. So this is a conditional decomposition, condition on the realization of the spontaneous spike, and the reproduction probability is the lambda k are random variables. And then well and then we use um, this clan of ancestors idea which also appeared. So this paper somehow uh, um, a variation on the some works by Pablo, uh, Roberto, Nancy on the clan of ancestors. So we use this clan of ancestors idea. Uh, <coughs> so. Okay, so that's it. Now let's back, get back to neuroscience. So um, after writing this paper, so we have a uh, a perfect simulation procedure were uh, very happy, and then we said, well, but maybe we should look uh, to the literature to see if we can prove something which appears as qualitative effect. So there is this old paper by Goldberg, uh, Response of Neurons of the Superior Olivari Complex of the Cat, to acoustic similar of long duration. And they observed that in many experimental setups, uh, the interval between consecutive, uh, consecutive uh, uh, spike for one year uh, seems to be non-correlated. So uh, I, I'm quoting uh, the, the famous book by Gessner and Kistler, which says, indicating that the description of spiking as a stationary renewal process is a good approximation. OK? So that, that, that is a basic observation. and. Uh, it turns out that looking at the data produced by Siddhartha, Ribeiro, 
a few years ago, we found the same syndrome. So I, I had a set of data uh, produced by Siddhartha Ribeiro from the Brain Institute of Natal, and I had two students, uh, Andres Rodriguez and Karine Ajnuma, they looked at the data using the smallest maximizer criterion, and they found the renewal process. So I, I can tell you that you can find this kind of renewal procedure looking at data. But attention, <coughs> they looked at these neurons in the hippocampus. And uh, maybe one third of the neurons behave this way. Two thirds <coughs> do not behave this way. So there is something to be understood. Why some neurons behave this way and not the others? Is this due to the particular... They, they were doing uh, in resting situation. Uh, these are hippocampus of, uh, of uh, hats. They are in a small box, closed small box, in the dark, in a very safe situation. They are free to do whatever they want, a small box. And then they, they, they had the uh, electrode in the brain. So we got this data. And one third of the neurons of the hippocampus behave if you look at just a single neuron as a renewal process, not, not a Poisson point process, a renewal process. The, the, the in, inter spike activity is not the exponential. Now, life is a little bit more complicated than this because in a more recent paper, uh, now wrote and co authors, they found the evidence, it's not true. They found the that they, they are co negatively correlated. So if you have a long spike in time, then it's more likely to have a short spike in time. So the question is, can in our, can our model have this kind of behavior? Can we derive this? These facts are apparently contradictory, but can we account for them somehow? So to do this, we must uh, describe uh, the interacting graph of the system. Until now, we have very, very general situations like the brushing type condition. Now we must say something more specific. And um, <coughs> so let me call the neurons vertices. Uh, I say that there is a direct edge from neuron J to neuron to neuron I to neuron J, if the synaptic weight is different from zero. And now the question is, so I have a graph, a direct graph. What kind of structure should this graph, should I uh, give to this, to this graph? And now there is this wonderful paper by Beck and Plan. One, because it's well written, lots of interesting ideas. Uh, they claim if they have experimental evidence uh, in favor of uh, slightly over, uh, over critical Erdoschini uh, random graph. So I will explain what is Erdoschini random graph. Huh? Um, but the Erdoschini random graph is, is locally is, um, is, a branching, is a branching graph. And the, in the super critical case, it has just a, a, a uh, a giant component, component. So our goal is to be in this giant component. So we will be slightly over the critical point. And uh, I'm quoting here the paper by Bags and Plan. So you see, I put in red, they claim that they found a critical branching process. They claim. So uh, let's do it to see what we, we, we get. <coughs> So that's clear. So uh, I'm telling that uh, I have a neuron. The neuron affects other neurons in a direct way. And then these neurons affect other neurons. And they say that uh, the more, so the one they found in their data, their data was culture of neurons and slices of cortex. So maybe neurobiologists say, well, but the uh, culture of neurons is not really like a brain, maybe. But they, they claim that they have reasons for this. So it, it's interesting. OK, so let me tell you what is a critical erdos Remy random graph. So uh, I have a finite set, very big but finite, set of uh, vertices. And then I decided to put uh, a, a, an edge between, uh, from i to j in an iid way. 
And to simplify, uh, synaptic weight will be only one or zero. Hmm? Only one or zero. But they are chosen in an independent way with property P1 minus T. So that's uh, the classical Eldos Rene model, which was invented in 61 six years uh, in the past. Day. In 53, I guess. Now I take uh, the probability equal lambda over n, and lambda is likely over n. 1 over n is a critical case, so I take it slightly over. So observe that the, 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 the edge are wij and wj are, are, are different and, and independent. Now, what are, what is, what are the results? So, so the question. Uh, I tell you, I had a, a spike at time Li of t. And then I, I wonder, I ask you, what is the property of having a new, new spike at time t? So the question is the following. So let, let's suppose uh, uh, Pablo has a block, a very influential block. And then one day Pablo writes in his blog, look, uh, this year people should look uh, at the uh, direct percolation questions. And then, well, and then he changed his mind after some time. But Fabio read, read this blog, oh, that's a good idea. And Isaacu also, and Fabio also. So then everybody became very interested in uh, direct uh, uh, Eldoshenin model. And then this becomes an important motion. At some time later, Pablo receives a blog, reads a blog of, uh, written by Roberto, who read the blog by Fabio, read the blog by, by uh, and then Roberto says, Erdogan model are interesting models. And Pablo says, well, let's look, let's, let's look at Erdogan models. So an idea which starts with Pablo come back to him. I want to say, is it possible that a spike which took place uh, I have here I. Then I have a spike here, and I want to, to, to know if there's a, there will be a new spike here. But maybe sometime sooner, I influence the J, and J influenced V, and so on, U, and sometime later, this chain returns. So the question is is this possible for this model? Using the Erdos-Rémy graph, and the result is the following. So that's my question. Um, how long does it take until this influence returns to the starting neuron? And uh, well, uh, let me call C i of one the sets of the neurons which are directly influenced by i, and then C two. Uh, CI2, C32, so the successive people which are influenced by people are influenced by people influenced by I. So the question, the mathematical question uh, has to do is how long, how many steps you need until the influence return to I. And the proposition is the following, that's a very easy proposition, position. the probability of the the recurrence time to be smaller than k, uh, it decays this way, where n is the number of neurons, and uh, theta is a parameter appearing in the, in the property of putting a edge. And from this, it follows. <coughs> there, is, there is a minus, yes. There is a minus. Uh, and then uh, this implies the following theorem. So you have a good set of random graphs. This good set of random graphs has a very big probability. And in this good set, for any graph in this good set, the covariance is bound above by 1 minus delta to the power of square root of n. And since n is quite big, this is very small. So uh, this 
say tell us that the Goldenberg result is somehow uh, reasonable, but it's not in the paint. Uh, I would like to have a, a, um, a lower bound. Okay, so that's the end. I tell you now something about the new steps. I'll be right in time. <coughs> so next steps. Well, first step is uh, hydrodynamics. There is a first paper on this direction by uh, Eva, Anna De Masi, Enrico Pesut, and myself. And why is this important? Uh, well, if you want to describe EEG time evolution, if you want to describe uh, functional magnetic resonance imagery time evolution, you need to do some uh, global picture, uh, some kind of uh, local uh, mean field model, mesoscopic models. And in this model, we consider the mean field model. The first step is a very tough paper. Probably you don't have the right tools yet. It's a 42 page paper. But uh, I mean, first step, I hope Pablo and other experts will help us doing next uh, progress on this. So, first thing. Now, um, yesterday, Marcelo. Uh, show a very nice situation in which they consider the way external stimulus influence uh, the activity of a single neuron in a lit and far integrated model. Well, my model is a kind of generalization of this. So we need to put, to put some kind of external stimulus and to prove that different, uh, different external stimuli drive your system into different states. And state I mean uh, in the sense of statistical physics, uh, another law. So this is something which has to be done. <coughs> now we need to include brain plasticity. And this means to include at the same time a time evolution in the graph. The random graph should change in, as a function of the external stimulus in a different time scale for sure. Now where we are trying to do a first step in the reaction with Guillermo Chekna and the Evolution and um, finally, um, the real question is to take an experimental data and to say, look, for this data, in this class of model, the model which fits better, the more in a more economic way, is this one. And this is something which must we must develop. There is no statist, uh, no theory now available for this. The history model selection is something which it must be done. I have students doing on this, or work on this, but uh, uh, people like Roberto Inguzero, no, not this, is, is Roberto here, should, do, should, should do work on this. Hmm? Yes, you are. So you should do this, Roberto. No, I shouldn't have raised my hand. Okay, so um, so that's uh, the web page of the Neuromath project. I invite you to visit them. And we have uh, several postdoc post fellowships available for bright young problems and statisticians. So if you want to work in stochastic modeling in neuroscience, please send me a message. Thank you very much.